Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the April 9th meeting of the Northampton Planning Board. Um, tonight on the agenda is a continuation of an appeal of Central Business Architecture Permit granted to Valley CDC by Garibaldi Associates, LLC, for property at 256 Pleasant Street, Northampton, MAP ID 32C 171337. Um, before we get started, it's uh, general practice. If anyone has comments that they want to make to the board, uh, you're welcome to come up for a public comment session, um, preferably not on the things that we will be considering in the agenda. So any, any public comment about anything other than the continuation of an appeal? No, okay, thank you. Um, I'll give you sort of a, a more detailed uh, agenda of what we think we're gonna march through tonight. Um, first, we've offered uh, an opportunity for the appealant to give a presentation and they have a copy of the staff report that was written about the appeal. Um, following that, um, the board will have Q&A, if you do, um, of, of that process. And then um, uh, I'd like to ask that uh, Valley CDC um, come up and respond to that as they can. And uh, then we'll have public comment. And following public comment, we'll close the public portion of the meeting. And then the board itself will discuss the appeal. and. Uh, then we'll take a vote and it, um, it needs to be a super majority to overturn the appeal. Um, I would also just by way of introduction say um, this is an unusual process for the planning board to be in to review another committee's work. Um, it has not been done before. There has not been an appeal before, uh, at least in planning board memory. Um, and so we are, we're not, we're working our way through this is basically what the answer is. Um, it did mean that we were all given the guidelines, which we know of, but we don't work with them regularly as that committee does. We've gone and gone through those, and we too have the planning office's staff report. So um, one last sort of comment is tonight's meeting is about the appeal. It's not about the building itself, the permitting, uh, the discussion of the planning board's project has moved forward that has gone to city council so tonight i would appreciate if if you would help me keep the the message on the appeal and discuss that instead of the entire project so thank you you have a presentation from the appellant i do thank you uh, my name is alex glover and i represent the appellants Garibaldi Associates is the name of the business that owns the optical studio, that the building that is at 274 Pleasant Street. So I'm actually going to, uh, with your permission, just give you some things that will help orient you to what we're talking about in terms of where this building is located and the layout of the neighborhood. Um, I have multiple copies. I have one set for me <laughs> Um, is a formal set, and I actually apologize. I only brought two additional sets, so if it was possible, it's fine. It'll work its way around that way. Here's one set. Hopefully, we have a more than one Thank you. It's a green for being like This is an appeal of the architecture permit that was issued to the um, to Valley CDC, which is the contract purchaser, is my understanding, of the lumberyard property owned by Gail LaBarge. This is not an appeal asking this board to second guess specific determinations that were made by the architecture committee in evaluating this project. Um, to just back up a little bit about the process, uh, and forgive me if you already know this, so I'm just going to, since this is a new appeal, that, the type of appeal you haven't handled before, I just want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, as you probably know, in the central business district, there are very few zoning restrictions. You can build all of the things being equal up to your property line. You can build to a certain height. 
Um, you have no parking requirements per se. Um, there aren't very many limitations on what you can do. And there's a reason for that. There's an, an effort to encourage a certain type of structure. There's also an architecture component to the central business district. Also, there's a West Street district, but that's not an issue here. Um, in order for someone to get a permit to build, they need to get a permit under the architecture, the, uh, they need to get an architecture permit from the architecture committee in the central business district. Um, and that's an ordinance that is separate from your zoning bylaws. So this isn't exactly a zoning appeal. It's an appeal under the ordinance. And the reason we're arguing it to you is because that's what the ordinance says. You come to the planning board with the appeal. Um, the crux of this appeal is not, again, to second guess specific determinations that were made on a specific window or anything like that. Um, the, the appeal is really on two grounds. One ground is that the architecture committee has a certain jurisdiction. What are they allowed to consider and what should they consider when they look at a structure and decide whether they're going to issue a permit, ask the applicant to make changes, or deny the permit? Um, that jurisdiction, and I'm just going to take you through very specifically so you have it in front of you, that jurisdiction applies uh, in relevant part to any portion of the structure that's visible from the street. Um, there are different requirements, obviously, for different components of the structure, but that's the jurisdiction. The crux of the appeal with regard to the jurisdiction is that the architecture committee was under the impression, apparently, and I want to speak for them, but in any event, the ruling really only applied the architecture uh, design guidelines or character defining features to the small portions of this structure that touch the street. Now, I'm going to show you in a second what we're talking about, but the structure, as you may know, <coughs> is going to be a, essentially almost a 90,000 square foot single building. It um, has a small frontage on Pleasant Street and then wraps back towards the railroad tracks and then goes south, comes out on Holyoke Street. So this structure is going to wrap around essentially from Pleasant Street all the way around. There's several abutting buildings and out to Holyoke Street. In the package I just gave you, the top um, document, these are documents that were prepared by the architect for the CDC. So if you look in the lower right hand corner, it says EX100. This is just a, an aerial view. Um, if I can come around just so I could point and then I'll go back. So if you can see the lumber yard, this is Pleasant Street, the street there that goes left to right is Pleasant Street. The lumber yard property starts here and it wraps all the way around behind to the, to the tree line and the railroad tracks and back and comes out on Holyoke Street. That's where the building's going to be constructed. The Garibaldi Associates, which is the appellant here, owns the building that is if you will, furthest to the right in that cluster of buildings. It's at the corner there of Holyoke and Pleasant Street. This picture in my reproduction has a slightly pinkish roof color. And that's the optical studio. Then the building in the middle, which is a photograph sort of a long, narrow <coughs> building with a grayer roof line. That's uh, 270 Pleasant Street. And that's now the Royal Law Office. And that's a restored industrial building in the mill style. And then the building after that, as you're going to the left, which is the north, is um, the lumber yard property. And that's the frame retail shop that you're familiar with seeing from the street. Directly behind that frame, real, uh, the retail shop, is a, another industrial mill building. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, So in terms of the project in general, there is a, so the, the architecture district, the whole point of it is to um, control and encourage 
desirable architectural details within that district. And it's, it's actually important and it's excellent that Northampton has it. Um, many towns haven't thought this far ahead and a number of cities have not. Um, I'm just going to very quickly, the purpose that you look, chapter 156 is your ordinance for the architecture district and the purpose of it is to preserve and enhance the pedestrian scale character, culture, economy, mm -hmm. and welfare of downtown Northampton by preserving historic and architecturally valuable buildings and features and encouraging compatible building design. The building that's being proposed to be constructed, the 89,000 89, square feet, is a tremendously overscale structure. And I don't mean that in any kind of a, like a subjective uh, judgmental sense that, that I'm uh, describing it in a way. It is, and, and I have photographs to show you, it is significantly huger taller and, and it's the, the footprint um, than any combination of buildings in the area. This building will be visible from the street, from Pleasant Street, for many blocks as you drive up towards the Lumberyard property. So everyone coming into Northampton number five is going to see it. And coming south from downtown Northampton out towards, uh, on five out towards the pipe, also um, it will be visible for a very long way. It absolutely dwarfs the buildings around it. Um, it, it, is out, it is not in scale of any buildings that are even in view of it. Um, and it has uh, design features that do, I think what happened was the, com the committee act looked at the design features, looked at the two small pieces of the building that are going to touch the road and apply those design features, the guidelines, um, the character defining features to those small areas. But what apparently felt they could not or should not apply those same guidelines to the remainder of the building. Here's why it matters. You're going to see most of this building from everywhere. So it matters a lot. It's not a technicality where there's an, under, <coughs> there's an alley and if you stood sideways you could possibly see the side of the building. This is what you're going to see in Northampton for the next hundred years. The other thing I, I want to make really clear is that Garibaldi Associates and the building, the optical studio, uh, is owned and run by Mary Beth Herb and Mary Finn. If you know Mary Beth Herb and Mary Finn, you know that they are absolutely in favor of affordable housing of good construction in Northampton. They want affordable housing in the location of this project. They have no objection to this very project. They are not saying do not build a building there, do not put affordable housing. This is not what they're saying. What they're saying, and these two people who are extremely liberal and active and have been here in the community and raised children here and had businesses here forever, um, are saying this structure simply does not comply with either the um, sort of the meaning or the actual letter of the guidelines um, and um, the details of it. I talked a little bit about the fact that the, although there's jurisdiction of the visible part of the building, the guidelines were not applied to part of the building. I'll show you which part. The second issue is that the guidelines require um, and the ordinance requires that if a historic building is going to be <coughs> demolished that there's I'll show you the language there's a real bias in favor of keeping the building there's a presumption can it be used can it be restored is it feasible and only then if the answer to all those questions is no may the building be demolished um, and uh, whatever new building is constructed is supposed to evoke the details of the old building in whatever way is practical. It, it's new construction, no question. Um, if, you, if you don't mind looking at the package of photographs, again, the next picture down is simply the front, the front view. The green building on the right is the optical studio. The one in the middle is the restored mill building, um, the law firm, and then there's the lumber company. Okay, so 
the way the ordinance works is that it defines what the jurisdiction is, and that's in section 156.5, and it defines it by everything in the district is jurisdictional except what's exempt. So <clears throat> under 156.5C, subparagraph 2, what's exempt is exterior architecture features which are not visible from a public street. So if it is visible from a public street, it's jurisdictional. If it's not visible, it's exempt. Um, but that's qualified, provided that those exterior features would not be visible even in the absence of freestanding walls, fences, signs, accessory structures, or landscaping. So you're supposed to pretend, in order to see if there's the, the committee should look at the architectural significance, you pretend that landscaping, walls, fences aren't there, that you can see through them. That's not really an issue here, but um, but it's important to understand because that's the crux of one of the legal issues with uh, the decision that the committee made. So the next step in the, that the committee uh, underwent is to look at 156.6, which is the permitting process, and down under subparagraph D, there are the instructions about how they're supposed to proceed. Um, if the project's not exempt, then the committee determines the details and character of the project by going through these sub-paragraphs. The first one is, see if uh, you look at the applicability and design guidelines in the design guidelines manual. I'll show you that in a second. The second one is, if, if this structure is jurisdictional, but can't meet all of those design guidelines, that's okay. Then you can look at the character defining features, that's subsection B, that are also in the design guideline manual. And then there's a provision for waiver, which did not, did not occur in this case. But there is such a provision. So, so we're looking at the design guidelines manual. Now, the only guidelines the committee has they're supposed to look at the manual. There's no other direction for them other than look at the manual. That will give you the guidelines for how to um, review this project and to determine what you're going to require of it in terms of the architecture permit, whether you'll allow it or deny the permit. Um, you will see, I believe, in both the decision and in Ms. Mish's report to this board um, that the guidelines are, in fact, guidelines. That's true. They are all phrased um, in, in language that is not mandatory. This is a discretionary exercise for the Architecture Committee. It is. There's no specific black and white. It must be, well, there's height. You know, there's some black and whites, but they're not at issue here, really. Um, so there's no argument about that. But it doesn't mean that the de design guidelines manual means nothing. I mean, it's the only guidance that there is for <coughs> committee members, excuse me, yes, for committee members to make determinations. So it has to have some significance, and it does. Um, the building that was in the location, um, that is in the location there, that mill building that I told you about that's set back from the road behind the frame building is a specific category of building that's protected or identified and defined in the design guidelines manual. And that's important to start because it's undeniable that that building is, in fact, a historic building as defined under this manual. On page 9 of the design guidelines manual, there's, they go through different types of architecture that you can find in the district. Industrial buildings and the character of vernacular architecture. And uh, there's a little paragraph that writes up about mill buildings and talks about a more standard industrial elevation repeated in mill towns throughout the Commonwealth, low front gabled roof above multiple stories of segmentally arched windows. They refer to a specific building on Masonic Street. Um, and it says the varied and purposeful history that these few industrial buildings convey adds a full dimension to the district's character. Um,
And, and in fact, it's true that if you go back historically, that area, the, the um, west side of Pleasant Street, the, the west side of Pleasant Street between the railroad tracks and Pleasant Street, and on the other side was an industrial area. It was for the railroad. There was a stop there. There, was, there were mills. There was a foundry, as I'll show you on an old map. Um, and, uh, and then the lumber yard after that. So it's unquestionably that is the vernacular in that particular area on that side of the street. It was these, what I think are beautiful uh, brick mill buildings. Now I covered up my little. So the design guidelines, again, emphasize scale, compatibility, details that are appropriate to the area where the, there's a reference to theme building, so details that are relevant um, and appropriate for the theme of the building. Do you, by any chance, have, do you all have the design guidelines manual with you or no? I have some portions of it, and, okay. and I think it might be good at this point to just for the, the public that's seeing this, that when you're talking about guidelines, there are actually 15 specific guidelines called out in the, in the document. Yes, the, the, the manual is this integrated book, and it has an introduction and an explanation, right, of um, the different types of architecture that can be found in Northampton, why we care about them, um, what's preferred, what's discouraged. Uh, and um, has the specific design <coughs> guidelines you just referred to, the numbered guidelines, and then has a section at the end that talks about character defining features, which is um, a, a more, a shorter bulleted list. And that's that alternative um, method of judging the architecture of the building, if for some reason it doesn't fit into the character defining features. So it might be good if you would summarize for us the two points that you started out to make? Well, what I'm, I, I will absolutely do that. I can do that right now. What I want to do is also just take you through the specific issues by pointing to the pictures, okay. in whichever order you'd prefer. It's fine. Um, what, it, what I'm doing is if you could turn, <clears throat> while you're doing that, I'll just fill in by saying when we're talking about building types, the guidelines refer to four different kinds. The theme building, which is more the nature of the one we're discussing. Um, there are landmark buildings like the academy. There are uh, transitional residential buildings that have been residences turned into commercial buildings. And then there are anomaly buildings, which are uncharacteristic of the rest of town. Yeah, and in fairness, the optical studio would qualify as an anomaly mm -hmm. building. Um, so if, if you could turn, flip a couple pages, um, it's one of the artist renderings, and it's the lower right-hand corner, it says A206. So you're actually in the guidelines. No, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the, ah. in, under the photographs, just so I can then point out to you a couple things. Okay. Um, the, these it's in the, it's absolutely, I'll show you. It's in the pile of the ones I gave you, and it's down a few. It's A206. There you go. So these are, there's a series of artist renderings, and I know that as a planning board, you're well familiar with these. These are on the best day what this building will look like. It's the aspirations um, and the drawings of the architect and, to, to demonstrate what this is going to look like. This is the facade as it was redesigned that faces Pleasant Street. Um, I'll point out to a few things, but it's a brick faced facade, which is appropriate, and I'll show you where I, it's strongly preferred under the guidelines. Um, it has windows that are um, inset, it has lintels that supportive. Um, it's usually in the old buildings, it's granite um, above the window and sills below the window that are visible. Um, it has some articulation uh, and meets the other requirements of touching, essentially touching the street and with the setback front. So 
there was a, an evaluation of this, this particular part of the building. It was altered during the process, during the, the architecture um, committee process, and this is what they came up with, with an intent to incorporate the um, architecture guidelines. If you could, there's a couple of them here, but if you could just, I think, turn one page oh, to be A205. Now, this is the other view. This is from the north looking, looking south. Um, you see the facade there that is the brick and the, got the detailing there on the top. Look to the left. That is what the remainder of this building looks like. Um, and what I would suggest to you is, without making any judgments about whether that looks nice or not nice, because that doesn't matter to me, um, what, what matters is that the incredible scale and mass of this building, and that's only the short side of it. I have another picture that will show you the long side of it. Um, the architecture guidelines were not applied to the portions of the building that are visible from the street, but were not there touching the street. And there's a huge difference. Um, if you turn one more page to A207, you can see this is a little bit from the south looking towards the optical studio. It's really almost looking due west. This shows the Holyoke Street entrance to the building. Again, brick, the um, windows are inset, there's the lintels, there's sills on the windows, there's some cornicing along the very top, and to the left, all of that gray and white is cement board. Um, Again, this is facing Pleasant Street. Um, it's visible from uh, both Holy Street and Pleasant Street. And I can tell you it's going to be visible coming all the way up um, from the pike. But the guidelines were not applied to that portion of the building. If you turn one more to A208, um, you can see the back part of what you were just looking at. This is sort of the railroad tracks to your back, <coughs> looking towards Pleasant Street. And again, you see there's the brick facade there, on, there with all the details. And then going back into the right, you see that none of the, those particular guidelines that I just referenced were um, incorporated. To go back a few to A204. And when you get to that one, just, just be aware uh, this is again a shot of the Holyoke Street side, and you see that large scale, massive portion of the building that goes back away from Holyoke Street. It's A204, it's a sunset picture if you have it. Um, it it's a little bit in this, in this rendering, uh, I, I think there's actually a sunset light that's been drawn on the building. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being snippy it, it I think it is because the the other renderings show in the direct light what the color and look of the building will be this looks it, to me when I first looked at it, it looked like there was brick on the parts of the building that went back away from Holyoke Street and and it's it's not it's the same as in those other photographs I showed you um, finally if you would look at a206 in this package which is back one more mm -hmm. Now, as a caution, this is the older design. It was changed. But the sighting, the mass, the height, and the walls of the building are the same. So A206 is, again, one of the renderings that will show you what this massive building will look like from the street. That Pleasant Street front it looks a little different. The, the other renderings you saw are what it's designed to look like now. But that whole gray wall with that, I'm going to say beige underneath, it's probably not the right color, um, that occupies the entire sky there and is going to be visible from everywhere. There are, the architecture guidelines are simply not applied to that wall in terms of detailing, windows, 
uh, wall covering, and here's why it matters. You're going to see it from everywhere. This isn't a tiny little building that you say, oh, well, again, you can see it technically from the street. Um, the whole point of the architecture district, why Northampton wants it, is when you build new buildings, um, you consider how large they are, whether they're in scale, um, and you apply these guidelines to try to have the architecture fit in um, and be at least architecturally compatible with the other um, architecturally significant buildings in the area. Um, very quickly, wall surfaces. I'm going to, if you don't have a full copy of the guidelines manual when you deliberate, you're welcome to mine. I just have colors on it, but you're welcome to look at it. If, um, if we need to, we have it projected, but I, okay. I would ask you to go ahead and, and, oh. and begin Sorry. to start wrapping up. Please. Um, would you like, this is Mr. Pill's copy. You're all set, you don't need it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I absolutely am, I'm gonna go through some specific references to the design guidelines manual um, and explain to you the demolition business. Um, I will go as expeditiously as possible. This is the appeal. So this is the only chance we have to put evidence in the record. And if, I'm, if I repeat myself, I apologize and I will try very hard not to do it. I'm also trying to go quickly. But as you say, it's the first time you've done this type of appeal. Um, going to page 36 in the design guidelines manual, this is one of the really important points. If you're going to have a building that is so out of scale to the other buildings in the area, um, that is so massive, it's going to completely dwarf and overwhelm the other buildings that are there now, including the Royal Law Firm, which is a historic building. You need to make sure what you're looking at has the architecture de details that are required. Um, under page 36, um, wall surf for theme buildings, Wall surfaces, which are visible from streets, should be predominantly brick and or traditional varieties of stone. Metal detailing's okay. Um, false materials are okay if they replicate an appropriate historic appearance of brick, stone, or metal. Stucco is an acceptable surfaces for walls not fronting on a street. These are wall surfaces. Goodness knows they are visible from the street. They are not brick. They are cement board, and it's what you're going to be looking for forever, looking at forever. Um, again, I don't believe that these guidelines were applied. I think the response is going to be, well, the title of this says facade materials. If you look up facade, it means portion of a building or a structure that's facing a, a road. Um, but in addition, the entire guidelines do apply to anything visible from the street. Um, page 33 which is window, window sills and lintels. New windows should have visible, historically compatible masonry sills and lintels. Okay, um, just very briefly, it doesn't, except on the parts that, where the guidelines were applied on Pleasant Street and um, Front Street. Cornices, almost the same language, page 38. Decorative cornices at least two feet high should be built on the street facades of new theme buildings should reflect the detailed pennant-like patterns. I don't think rich patterning is, in fact, the vernacular, vernacular ar architecture for this particular area where it was um, industrial, but I'll show you a photograph of the building that's right there now that does have a cornice with that type of detail. Um, and then facade detailing is page 40. Um, if you... Please turn to, in the little package of photographs at the end, if you go at the back and you'll see a picture of a mill building. Looks like that. It's a few pages from the end. This is the mill building that's being demolished. Um, the decision describes it as Demolition of a series of dilapidated buildings. There are no findings about this building, which is clearly older than uh, 
1940, I'm sorry, let me give you that date, 5, which is on page 14 in the manual, historic building is defined as one that's older than 1945, period. Um, it clearly is, on this side, virtually intact from when it was a building. You can see the lintel, the granite above the windows that's strongly encouraged. It's the guideline. You can see the sill underneath the window. You can see the windows are slightly inset. You can see the cornice, which is actually pretty decorative, going around uh, the roof there at the top. Um, if you turn one more page, you can see uh, this is the top back of that same building. It's just the part of the building where the sunlight is hitting it, where it's red brick. The building in the foreground is um, not the building we're talking about. To the left is Amy Royal's building, and there's a wall that belongs to the, the mill building. But that red building, you can see again the cornice detail around the top. And the last photograph in the file is the photograph of that historic mill building from the back. Again, uh, I think I, I would assume that there's one window that's been boarded up there on the second floor, the second inn. But other than that, they're the same lintels, sills, window placement, brick, the roof line. Um, it all appears to be, in fact, intact. The, I, I don't think you know, we need to spend very much time at all on the fact the building's older than 1945. I did include a plan for you um, in the package. It's an old, it's a beautiful old map of Northampton. And in yellow highlight is the block between Short Street and Holyoke Street. And you can actually see this mill building on um, that old map. It's plate five of 1895. If, for some reason, the design guidelines, you couldn't meet the design guidelines, the board is then supposed to go to character defining features. And Ms. Mish also touched on this in her um, report. Those are on page 46 of the design guidelines manual. And again, um, we go down them very quickly. Design guideline three, buildings primarily of masonry construction, especially brick on Main Street and Upper Pleasant Street. And some detail about that. Um, four, compatibility. Buildings respect and are compatible with older buildings and the detail and historic character of downtown. Materials used in an appropriate scale for the particular material used in the way they would have been used historically and structurally and respect the pre-existing materials of surrounding buildings. Guideline eight, windows oriented in a size and design compatible with other buildings. Um, there's an encouragement that the windows line up with uh, at least one abutting building. And since there's a mill building right next door to where this building's going to be built, they could have lined the windows up. They're not exactly lined up. Um, 10 appropriate scale of buildings. This is really key. It can't be completely disregarded. One can't say we have these guidelines, but scale and mass we won't even look at, especially when um, the jurisdiction of the committee is to consider the scale, the massing, the relationship to other buildings, as well as what's going to be on the wall that you look at, the windows and the wall covering, et cetera. Ten under um, character defining <clears throat> features, buildings are designed to not overwhelm their neighbors. There is no way to say that this building does not overwhelm any of the buildings adjacent to it. Typically, building massing is limited to be compatible with neighboring buildings, but often appropriate scale is maintained by providing special detail to design elements to keep large buildings from overpowering small buildings. Again, uh, if the, these guidelines were applied to the entire part of the building that's visible from the street, instead of just the portion that's touching the street on Pleasant and on Holyoke, um, the application of these would have made a very big difference in the part of the building that, that, um, that's the concern. Um, and then number 12, this is talking about the historic masonry building, excuse me, the historic building. Defined herein is built prior to 1945. 
Historical buildings are not demolished, nor are historical features destroyed until they are carefully analyzed to ensure there are no practical alternatives. Functionally obsolete or otherwise inadequate buildings are carefully analyzed to ensure they cannot be adaptively reused and are aggressively marketed before demolition of buildings or historical features is even considered, the even is my word. The design of a new building is approved before a safe existing historical building is demolished. Um, again, not asking you to second guess a decision, there, is, there are no findings about the historic building that's on the site. In fact, that building is attached to and shares a wall with the other historic building, uh, the Royal Law Building, which is a separate issue. But um, it is not the part of the committee's charge, which is explicit, is try to keep mill buildings, historic buildings. And if you can't keep them, try to, try to reuse them. Um, and if not, you need to really incorporate that vernacular into the building that you do build. Just so you know, um, you do have a demolition bylaw for historic buildings. It's chapter 161. It doesn't apply. You don't have to look at it, because guess what the one exception is? Buildings that get an architecture permit. The only, so the architecture permit is the demolition permit. But there really was no discussion uh, in the decision, no findings. <clears throat> just that, that sort of dismissive, dilapidated buildings are going to be knocked down. Um, so we're not asking you to second guess that. We're asking you to uh, allow the appeal and overturn this permit so that the board, assuming they have another crack at it, and I'm sure they will, can come back and consider that. Consider the historic building. Consider what can be done or what aspects of it can be incorporated and to consider applying these features to that entire gigantic expansive building that's going to be overwhelming to all the buildings around it and visible. Um, from the street. The only other thing I will say is that, and, and I know this board hears other appeals and hears back and forth all the time, so I'm not going to do a big back and forth. I, I would <clears throat> suggest that um, just, I guess, three short things in, in uh, Ms. Mish's submission. Um, the first is that she says that we're saying that the architecture committee didn't review guidelines for interior walls behind other buildings that front the street. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is where you have a building that faces the street and is visible from the street within the jurisdiction of the architecture committee, they need to apply the guidelines to all parts that are visible and not just the part that's touching the street. Sometimes it doesn't matter. In this situation, because of that giant expanse, it does matter. Um, she uh, also points to, on page six of her submission, mill-type building. And, and I completely agree with her. She has two photographs here of mill-type buildings with the typical detail. And we're in agreement. Um, this is the detail that would be on this type of brick industrial building in this area where this building is proposed to be built. This detailing should be on all parts of the building visible from the street, not just the little pieces that touch the street. So we're in agreement of part of that. And, and then I would just, on page seven, there's a photograph of the mill building that is going to be demolished uh, if the construction goes forward. But unfortunately, the photograph that was provided in this submission it doesn't show all the parts of the building I just showed you, which is the brick, the cornice, the lintels, the intact windows. It shows you uh, a small portion of one part of the front side on Pleasant Street. Um, if you go park over by on Short Street, you can see that old mill building, the beautiful light brick with the cornice. Um, and uh, you can see it. You'll see the other photographs I gave you in your package of the street view. The actual Google Earth photographs show top of that mill building peeking out behind uh, the Royal Law Firm building. <clears throat> so in sum, this is not asking you to go back and say, that's red, it should be blue, rearrange windows a different way. It's not asking you to do that. It's asking you to help the committee go back and apply the guidelines that are in this clearly in the guidelines in the character defining features portion, and that Northampton really wants to have in the buildings that are being built. Um, and to 
give careful consideration to the historic building that's there and actually make findings about it rather than just dismiss uh, it along with those old frame buildings that are kind of rotting over in the corner. Um, this is going to have a gigantic impact. You're not going to hear a lot of whining about, oh, this is big and I'm little. But the truth is, this, is, this building is going to have a gigantic physical impact. Some of it will be positive. I, I suggest to you a great deal of it will be negative if it's allowed in this form. Um, this is not questioning the project, the affordable housing, the commercial space, the retail space. It would be great if they were all there. and. Um, my clients think it would be great if they were all there. It's this particular structure and how it fits into the architecture guidelines. Does anyone have any questions? <coughs> yeah, uh, if you've got questions of the presentation now, you should. Could, um, Ms. Butler, yes. you, you didn't address the comments that Carolyn made on the point about demolition of the historic building. Can you do that? Sure. I mean, she seemed to, she, she made points that justified the decision that was made that you didn't address. Well, she made um, an argument that the criterion to allow for demolition of historic buildings is for standalone buildings. I'm not aware of any source for that. I have no idea what that refers to. The mill building shares a party wall with, in a, in a corner, with the Royal Law Firm, um, but it is clearly a distinct building. You can see it in all the photographs. I mean, it, the fact that its corner touches another corner doesn't mean you can, that it's not a historic building. And there's nothing about standalone buildings in the guidelines that I'm aware of. If I missed it, maybe I did, but that's, I don't know that that's coming out of any, uh, anything in the ordinance, the guidelines, or the character defining features. She says it's not, she goes down and says, you have to analyze if it's a historic structure. Well, sorry to interrupt, sorry, but ahead. the next sentence she yeah. says that the guideline states that demolition can be approved when an appropriate new building has been designed to replace it. That's well, true. Is that correct? That's the, part that, that's the part that I read you, and I won't read it to you again, don't worry. Um, but uh, let me just, just give you the page number. Um, that's the part that I read you, which is, it's in two places, but if you look under the character defining features, number 13 is uh, the demolition. There's also a whole section about it under page 14, sorry, applicability, demolition of historic buildings. And you may want to just refer to that. Demolition of historic buildings defined as those built prior to 1945. That's the definition. Um, should be considered only after reasonable alternative, especially rehabilitation, have been fully considered. I don't know that that happened. It's certainly not in the decision, and it's required to be considered. For historic landmark or theme buildings, demolition should be considered only when the building is unusable, functional, functionally or structurally obsolete, and when an appropriate new building has been designed to replace it. So I think that's what she's referring to. But the question is whether there has been any analysis whatsoever of retaining that building, whether it can be worked around, what its historical value is, identifying the features. Does that answer that question? I think there was something else, too, in her. Um, no, that's it. Uh, th th thank you. Is there any, anything else? No, oh, thank you. So, mm -hmm. um, next presentation. Um, I'm take a look at this. No, it again. Hello, I'm a historical Homer. I'm an architect with Davis Square Architects. I've been the designer of this uh, uh, building. Uh, from when it started. Uh, what I'd like to do here is, I, I did, with uh, respect to Ms. Bruce's uh, uh, suggestion that we not talk too much about the building uh, itself, I would like to, uh, what I've done is uh, read uh, Ms. Misha's memo, and what I'd like to provide is uh, kind of three things I'd like to do, maybe point out a few uh, uh, 
uh, errors, I believe, uh, from the previous presentation that I think I'd like to be sure is straight in the record. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the scale and detail. I think that it is a recurring theme that we've t uh, talked about tonight. Uh, I'd like to reintroduce into the record something that I think all of you have seen already, which was a detailed analysis that my firm did of the design guidelines. And I'd like to make sure that uh, I, I won't go through and read all of them, but I will introduce it uh, into the record. I think you already have it, actually. We, we submitted that slideshow. And then finally, talk a little bit about the, uh, the demolition aspect of the development, and I'll, I'll make this pretty quick. I think all of you know, but to remind anybody who doesn't know, uh, we presented two times to the Central Business District group. Uh, we had uh, uh, some significant feedback after our first uh, presentation. We took it to heart and uh, really believe that the, uh, uh, the application of the guidelines were uh, very well clarified for us. We feel that we had followed the guidelines as guidelines. I think this is made in the planning report that these are guidelines. They are not requirements. They're guidelines. And uh, I think by the time we were back in January with another presentation, we had uh, an approach to this development that uh, we truly believe is going to enhance uh, enhance the city and very much fulfills the goals of the guidelines. But to quickly go down a few of the points that I, I want to make sure that are clear, uh, the actual area of the building it is 69,000 square feet. It's not, I think it said 99,000, it is 69,000 square feet is the area of the building. Uh, there was a point made about no other buildings, even combinations of buildings, having the kind of combined length of this building that are uh, visible from the site. In fact, just the building just north of Short Street is a, uh, an aggregated building with a, a lineal, uh, with a length that is uh, virtually the same as our building. And it's uh, in, uh, you can actually see it right from our site. Uh, I think also there was a, uh, a notion that the old renderings really aren't that different. I think you were looking at some of the images of the old renderings. In fact, the old renderings are significantly different from the, uh, the, the second uh, submission that we made, uh, particularly with the height of the building. It changed quite a bit on the parapet that faces Pleasant Street. There were some really big changes on that. So. The uh, you know references really should be made to the project that's on the table, uh, not something that was abandoned in January. Uh, also, uh, there are parts of the building that are, uh, even though there are parts of the building that are visible uh, from Pleasant Street, that are not on the primary elevations of Holyoke and uh, uh, well Holyoke and Pleasant Street. I just wanted to make the point that, in fact, there are buildings. They are smaller buildings in front of the building, so there really are uh, partial views of the building. So it's a kind of a small point, but they are, they are in fact, partial views. Uh, I did want to make the point that the color of the building isn't selected yet, uh, so that uh, that's something that uh, remains to be decided. Uh, and I, I think a very important point is uh, the building that is uh, slated for being torn down is not attached to uh, to our build or to uh, Amy's building to the little gable and brick building. Uh, and to be perfectly clear about what we sent a, an engineering firm out here, Sousa True, their large uh, engineering firm in the Boston area, to do a structural analysis of the building. The buildings touch in one area uh, for the purpose of making a roofing detail is, is what they do. They do not share a party wall. The buildings are completely structurally independent. Uh, and that's an important point. It's something that uh, uh, we need to know before we would demolish a building. We really need to understand everything about that building. And it is uh, uh, completely structurally independent. A small point, but uh, the renderings are. Uh, 
were categorized as being, uh, you, know, a, you know, aspirations. In fact, they're they're quite accurate. The renderings are all very carefully computer generated with accurate dimensions. Uh, the material renderings, uh, to the degree the materials have all been chosen, are uh, pretty accurately rendered. So. Uh, those are the points I wanted to make that I think, uh, just to be clear of uh, what we're really talking about. As far as scale, uh, there's, I'd like to introduce the document uh, in the, oh, I took them. So I'll pass these out and uh, what, I'll wait for the microphone. Thank you. So uh, again, uh, what I did uh, for tonight, uh, to keep it somewhat brief, was I did start with uh, Carolyn Mish's memo and uh, amplified it, and that's the point of this document. The memo talks mainly about stories of buildings and reinforces our point that the building actually does fit in very nicely with the scale and certainly is well within the guidelines. What I've included in this little package, it spreads out about a block and a half. Uh, the first time that we provided in, in one of the slideshows, it may have been both of the slideshows that we presented, we had <coughs> dimensions of buildings to make the point about scale and how this one would fit in and certainly how it is well below what's allowable under the guidelines. Uh, we did those, we estimated those building heights by counting bricks and uh, various other uh, methods and I wanted to make sure that we were pretty close on that and came out again just this past week uh, with some more accurate measuring tools and so I, that very first sheet shows you buildings within a block and a half and as you can see from our site the building right adjacent to us is uh, 35 and a half feet tall and the buildings within a block and a half range all the way up to almost 48 feet tall. So, uh, and I think the, uh, that the diagram with the heights is followed by photographs of the building so you'll all know the buildings we're talking about. Uh, and I think probably the most significant ones are, of course, the ones that are quite close by. Our building is 42 feet tall. It has a section of parapet on the, uh, on the street elevation sides that adds another two and a half or three feet. So uh, I thought it was important to reinforce the point that had been made in the planning memo. Uh, I think the, uh, I'll talk quickly about the guidelines and reintroduce a document. I think that for those, and I think all of the planning board members were here during the presentations I think they know that uh, we studied the guidelines uh, intensely and uh, Im applied them to our building designs, both the first and the second. But I would like to reintroduce this document. I'm not going to read through it all. A lot of it is repetitious, but the first several pages are highlights uh, from the guidelines that I think demonstrate that, that our structure uh, is in close conformance with the national. Um, as far as, and I, I think, unless you really want me to, I, I, I'll just really briefly say that the, the character of the building, you know, ranging from all the way from ground up, of how high off the ground we have uh, a little ledge before we start our windows, the glazing in the first floor, the floor, the openness to create uh, a pedestrian engagement with the building, alignment of some of our details with the adjacent building uh, next door, uh, the detailing of the windows on the street facades, 
uh, cornice detailing, uh, uh, obscuring uh, mechanical equipment through the use of a decorative parapet. Uh, it's all in the uh, materials that you've already received. So I won't go through all of that again. I think uh, Carolyn summarized that pretty nicely. Uh, the last point I'll make, uh, and just let me make sure I'm getting everything. <clears throat> yeah, the last point I'll make is uh, a few brief comments about historic analysis. In fact, we looked uh, very hard at whether there were any options for retaining that building and for the type of use, uh, certainly the footprint of the, of the building, is it really compatible? It's not sitting on the right place on the site. It's in a pretty poor condition. And we did have the, uh, we followed through uh, with, and this is at the, you'll see on the last couple pages of that handout, that's the application to the Mass Historic Commission that we submitted for their review of the building and their analysis of its historic value. That's, uh, and there's a rather messy rubber stamp, which is how they answered these kinds of applications. It looks like they double stamped it, but it does in fact state that uh, there's no impact from the demolition of this building. Uh, to follow up on that, I want to uh, pass out a memo, brief memo. In fact, I'll read a little bit from it just for the crux of it. This is a memo that was prepared by Epsilon Associates. Epsilon Associates is one of the largest historic consultants in the state. Uh, they work on innumerable uh, historic uh, projects for my firm and many, many more throughout the state. And I had uh, uh, Maureen Cavanaugh prepare this to help, uh, to help you understand what that no impact determination actually means. So she wrote a short description of that. And I'll uh, read that. Uh, the MHC, Mass Historic Commission, reviews PNFs, that's a project notification uh, that you've got in front of you, to determine if a proposed undertaking has the potential to adversely impact significant historical or archaeological resources. The CDC, that being Valley CDC, submitted, uh, submitted the PNF. It was received December 9, 2014, in compliance with State Register Review and MEPA requirements. In accordance with the MHC regulations, uh, MHC <coughs> reviewed the PNF concluded that there are no state register properties within the project's area of potential impact. The MHC, uh, this is the Mass Historic Commission, determined that the project is unlikely to affect significant historic or archaeological resources in their finding dated February 3, 2015. Uh, last paragraph, this MHC's no significant resources finding concludes a review of the project under state historic regulatory requirements. So, uh, you know, going beyond our own findings that there was no uh, practical way to engage this building in the kind of development that uh, Valley CDC is proposing uh, combined, uh, I think combined with the, uh, our own review of it by uh, significant historic consultants, and then finally the approval by MHC. Uh, I hope we'll put that to rest. was about all I had to say. So if you have any questions, uh, I, I could point out a couple more factual uh, points that will be addressed, and this is a little, uh, that need to be addressed, and they're uh, technical points. And I want to be sure this is really clear, that uh, the one virtually freestanding building that is, uh, that we're actually preparing the demolition drawings for now, uh, there is a piece of a building that is 
at the back of uh, Amy's building that is a remnant from a previously demolished building that was on the site. That, uh, we're not proposing to demolish that piece that is attached to her building. Our proposal is to restore. It's in terrible shape. It needs repointing. There are areas that need to be rebuilt in this piece that is another layer. That, that part could argue, arguably be called a party wall, even though there's open space on the other side of where another building once stood. And uh, that we're leaving in place, uh, but restoring it so that it will weather better and hold up over the years. It's not clear what color the fiber board or whatever. It's what the, the it said that is a material that replicates historic clapboards. It's called hardy panel or hardy plank, excuse me. And uh, we haven't made the final selection of the color of the building. So on okay, so so on a four, so a number of the drawings. It shows it as a very light gray, almost white. Mm -hmm. And then on the sunset picture, it shows it as almost brick colored. Mm -hmm. So it's neither of those? I mean, it's yet to be determined. I, th I don't think that the color selection was in the, under the purview of the uh, commission. Uh, what, what we normally do to determine uh, the color of the building is we you know, engage in an appropriate process which uh, it certainly involves building mock-ups, you know, so we can see, you know, first we want to select the brick. The brick, we have probably a stronger opinion about what the brick should look like. Uh, we want it to be compatible with the building next door. Uh, so that, that will be a, a less, uh, less option, or fewer options available on that. The color of the building that we, we just haven't selected yet. either pick a color of hardy board or a hardy board is paintable and either one of those are for you to determine that's right that's right and we, we selected a material that is uh, very long lasting and holds paint uh, very I guess what well. I'm trying to clarify is there's nothing in the guidelines that precludes a painted surface no and, and actually I, I forgot to mention in that package that I did pass out in addition to the uh, MHC application form right before that there are some images also I think an amplification of what Ms. Mish prepared uh, you'll see a couple of buildings right up the street right before you get to Main Street of buildings that have brick facades that go back about 10 or 12 feet and then the remainder of the building uh, clearly visible from Pleasant Street is a clapboard siding Forgot to mention that. Also, there actually there are two images there. There's one that shows two buildings with that condition, and then there's a, another image of a building that has, or a couple of buildings that show a, a, a radically different window pattern on the side elevations, also visible from the street. So maintaining uh, many of the uh, features that are, are uh, described in the design guidelines and then as you go around the corner the material is still ma masonry but the window pattern changes radically and that occurs it's a very typical treatment on historic masonry structures okay we thank you okay thank you <laughs> My name is Michael Pell, and I'm one of the attorneys representing the Valley CDC. And there's just one brief point that I want to make that hasn't been addressed yet by anyone. Uh, this appeal is governed by Northampton Ordinance Chapter 156, Section 7. And I want to just read a couple of lines from that. Any issuance or denial of a permit by the committee 
meaning the Central Business Architecture Committee, of course, may be appealed to the Northampton Planning Board by an applicant or other aggrieved party. Now, Valley CDC is the applicant. We're not appealing. You've got a party before you, but aggrieved um, is a technical legal term. It means that there has been an infringement of some legal right. It doesn't mean that someone has objections to the way something looks. It doesn't mean that, for example, as in zoning, an abutter has a presumption of standing. As Attorney Glover noted, this is not zoning. This is something separate. And you haven't heard a word about how the appealing party is legally aggrieved by this decision. In fact, one thing that the use of the word agrees there brings up is whether Ordinance Chapter 156 is really even intended to create private rights in anyone. It is a public municipal planning process. If the Com Central Business Architecture Committee concludes that this is appropriate, then the question becomes whether there was ever any intention to um, grant through that ordinance chapter private rights to somebody else to come in and say, don't do this or that for reasons that I think Cliff Bomer's done a good job of refuting. And what I hope you will consider is that I believe this gives you a completely independent ground. If you're not aggrieved, you don't have standing. If you don't have standing, you don't even get to the gate. I mean, I, I certainly hope in your decision you'll consider the substantive matters, but I hope you will also address the issue because it, believe, it creates, I believe, an independent ground on which this appeal should be denied. Thank you. So does that bring up any more questions from the board? Because I'm thinking we'll open it up for public comment. I hear a move to do that. Second by Ann. Anyone here want to make a comment about the, what, we've, what we've dealt with so far? Yes, sir. Well, welcome. Uh, come, come state your name for us, please. Hi, my name is Richard Royal. Um, I just have a couple comments. Like, I was looking at the sheets here and stuff like that. And if everyone could sort of look at this picture that um, in the center there, that monsters my building, period. Without a doubt, it monsters my building. Um, another statement I would like to make is um, in reference to the parts of the building that are not brick. My historic building, when I actually went before the architectural committee and stuff like that, I was actually mandated to actually do stuff or they would not sign anything. So I had to spend more money buying windows and stuff like that. And they really pressed that anything seen from the street, it has to look right. It has to look brick. It has to, you know, they even put in color and they can't even say color, but they put in color anyway because they wanted it red or something like that to make sure it blended in with the surroundings. Mm -hmm. The stuff that the CDC's trying to build does not blend in with the surroundings at all. I feel it should be brick. Um, at one of the meetings, the past meetings for the architectural board, um, I think there was a, I, I can't recall who actually said it, but said, if it was all brick, would that break the bank? And I think Mr. Bowman said, um, if it was all brick, it would. And I think they decided not to do that, even though in my instances, it didn't matter how I felt about things. I had to spend more money, you know, and it was actually mandated to do so. People talk about their guidelines. I think their guidelines when they want to be guidelines, you know, in a way. And I was actually mandated to do stuff for that. Um, the last thing I would like to bring up is um, one of the comments by Mr. Bowman that the structure itself was reduced dramatically. It was not reduced dramatically. 
the only part that was actually reduced is the front, I think it's parapet, of the actual structure. None of the rest of the building was actually touched. And if you look at the old drawings and the new drawings, they're virtually untouched at all. So it, it, the size, he made it sound to me, and I don't know if it did to you, that they made efforts to try to shrink it because it is so large that it's surrounding everything around there. And it, that's just not the case. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? My name is Mary Finn. I co-own 274 Pleasant Street. There's a huge impact, I think we all agree, with the proposal on the table. What I do want to say, and it's been said before, I support affordable housing in Northampton, and I support it at that location beside my building. Families, individuals, working people, need a good place to live. I support that, I get that, I pay my CPA taxes, I pay my real estate taxes, my personal property taxes, I pay them as soon as the bill comes, I don't wait till May 1st. I am a good citizen in Northampton. I'm raising my family here, my children have gone to the schools here. If you wanna get your car washed, Northampton Boosters have a car wash on King Street Saturday, $4. <coughs> I'm a community member. I care about the neighborhood that I've invested money and time in. I'm sorry to see some of you look impatient with my comments, but they're heartfelt and true. I've been on that corner for 15 years. There is impact to me, my building, and my town, and it concerns me. The process concerns me, and the permit we're looking at concerns me. I do not support the structure as it's designed. The process was faulty. The architectural committee did not look at the parts of the building that they needed to look at that they have jurisdiction over. In fact, they were encouraged to ignore the large mass of the building that will be right outside my window. That's really, really long and unsightly, especially if we're going to call it a theme building. We have one chance to build on this location. We can do much better than what's proposed. We can follow our guidelines. We can follow our ordinances. All residents and visitors will see that building coming in and out of Northampton for 100 years. It is disharmonious with the neighborhood. It clearly is. When you look at the renderings that show the Royal Building, my building, and this massive ginormous, overwhelming structure. It's out of step with the building. When we've talked about mass in prior settings, whether it was a public meeting or a city council meeting or a CBC meeting, Davis Square architecture goes back to height. Mass is a whole other ballgame. Mass has not been addressed. The building swallows me up. Our patients tell us we're getting overwhelmed, we're getting eaten up. The ordinance and the guidelines say we should not be <coughs> overwhelmed, and we will be overwhelmed. It doesn't echo the mill buildings. It doesn't echo the detail on theme buildings. When you think about theme buildings, you think about what? The Academy of Music? This is a flat cement surface. It looks like a box store. It doesn't come anywhere near the beauty of what a theme building is expected to be in Northampton. This massive building will not preserve the neighborhood. It will not enhance the city of Northampton. The Architectural Committee needs to look at the whole mass of that building and provide better materials, better massing, and a better outcome for town. Thank you for listening. Last call for public comment, sure. My name is Amy Heflin, and I work at Keller Williams Realty, which is at 300 Pleasant Street, which directly faces 
where these buildings are proposed build. The, my building also has Lang Chiropractic. You've probably seen the signage on the top. I would like to say that um, I think it's offensive to say that uh, guidelines don't matter, and that's what's been suggested here tonight by parties who've spoken at this podium. Guidelines do matter. If guidelines don't matter, and it's all about requirements, and we cannot care about guidelines, then quite frankly, by definition, why make the guidelines and even write them down and think of them or see them in any way? I would like to say that what I'm for personally and as a, you know, I go to my building six to seven days a week and what I'm for is community involvement and community support. And I think it would be a stretch to say that there's been large scale community support, maybe by others who don't live and have businesses down in our end of town. But, you know, when you've got Mary Finn here, and we've heard from Amy Royal and some other businesses down in the town, I think community support <coughs> has got to matter for something. That's got to count for something, okay? We've heard about the hugeness and the enormity of it. I mean, I work in a building that's 9,000 square feet. It's 4,500 square feet on, on uh, each level. And this is m so much larger than the already large building I, I uh, work in and go to every day. I'm surprised I did not know that this was not going to be a brick building. My building is brick. I believe the building across the street from me where Northampton Coffee and the Oxbow Marina is brick. The Chilson building is brick. Brick dominates that end of town with the historic flavor and the nature of that end of town. The railroad tracks and the industrial quality in our end of town. And I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that there's going to be, it's going to be allowed to be hardy plank, a composite exterior or cement or something else other than historic brick. We've seen the building next to um, the, um, I believe that's brick next to the Clarion Hotel. New buildings go up all the time. Banks go up all the time. And the, the required requirements, or rather guidelines, are brick because that's the flavor of the neighborhood. And I just wanted to bring attention to that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes. I'd like to say something. Sure. Uh, my name is Barney Moore, and I own property in the neighborhood, too. Uh, I wasn't going to speak tonight, but um, I think it's important for the planning board to develop a trust in this process. And if the planning board is going to apply the guidelines in some situations, like what Mr. Royal described, but not in some other situations, um, because I've heard from uh, through the, throughout this whole process, I've heard we don't have to do that. We don't have to be harmonious in scale. We don't have to apply the guidelines. We don't have to do that. Well, that is a matter of trust, and I, I'm asking that you you do apply the guidelines in this situation and overturn um, the decision because of the guidelines weren't appropriately applied in all the, um, to the entire building so that we can trust this board, so we can trust the guidelines. You know, we read these guidelines and we say, wow, what a great city. This is the things that it cares about. But for some reason, the scale was, well, we want, we want this you know, affordable housing, so we throw everything out the window. Don't do that. We're just asking, you know, let us trust these guidelines. Make them go back. Tell them, look, at, go back and do this right and um, apply the guidelines appropriately. So I'd ask that you, uh, that you allow this appeal. Thank you. Thank you. So entertain a move to close public comment. Anyone else? I would keep it open. Just ah, it. advise to keep it open. That way you can ask, ask questions still. May I just address a single point that was new that was raised? Sure. Um, just to be sure procedurally we're um, on the same page. Um, uh, Attorney Pill spoke about aggrievement. I, I clearly people who own a building abutting and dwarfed by the new Construct, proposed construction are aggrieved for this purpose, meaning they are impacted in a way that's different from the public in general. So 
I, I strongly urge you not to take that as a ground for not for denying the appeal. I don't think that I don't think that would be an appropriate procedural or legal thing to do. Sort of aside from the rest of your job, I didn't want to let that suggestion hang out there. Thank you. It's a very uncommon occurrence to us. Mm -hmm. No, you're supposed to acknowledge that it happens all the time so that we can get it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the board has seen staff's comment. Um, do I assume that that will become part of the public record? It, it, I mean, it's, I, it it's part of the public record. So, and both players in this conversation have copies. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to suggest that we not go through that unless there's something that you want to, having listened to the presentations and the conversation, is there something you want to bring up of that, that in your report that you'd like to talk about? And that you can, you can all decide that we should go through it. That'd be perfectly fine. Yeah. I mean, you know, I could just, um, there's been some, rebuttal that the guidelines were not adhered to and that this statement is that they're guidelines and so therefore you can throw them out. But I think what um, I certainly tried to relay in the staff memo and it's up to you to make that determination as well is I don't think the central business architecture <coughs> threw out any guidelines. I think they went through very carefully and analyzed and made, came to their own conclusions about the fact that these were met. Um, and that they did consider all aspects of the building. There were modifications to the interior walls, and I mean interior meaning interior to the parcel, mm -hmm. not fronting on the street. Um, and they looked at how the, they talked quite extensively about carrying the character around, you know, wrapping the corners, and you were at the hearing as well, so you noted that. Um, and, um, I think just to um, clarify that, you know, it's about the context of downtown, not one side of the street, not one half block, but um, an entire downtown, and that the guidelines clearly emphasize the creation of new theme commercial <coughs> buildings um, to enhance and, and expand the vibrancy of downtown. Um, and then just to clarify the differences, you all um, heard and understand that there are four different types of character buildings that have been identified. And so each, the guidelines have you seen, discuss what to do in different scenarios. So you would have a different scenario for analysis of a theme commercial building that's brand new versus an historic building that you're trying to tinker with. And so the guidelines for um, modifications to an historic building mean that you have to match more carefully and specifically to that specific building. Um, so comparing modifications that might have been requested for a historic building is very different than the analysis that would go into um, looking at guidelines for a brand new building under construction. Um, so that's it, and if, I'd be happy to go through the staff report um, in more detail or sections of it. We could, I can put the graphics back on the screen, whatever you guys want. Anne? How far out on Main Street does this central business district go? How far beyond where we are? On are Prospect. We, on Prospect. Uh, yeah, on Pleasant Main Street. 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 Pleasant, sorry. On Prospect. Um, it goes um, currently to um, Holyoke, Holyoke Street. Um, so, and I can pull up the map so you What's can see really that. on the edge of this? It's towards um, no, the edge. Is, for, is where the, perpen the street is not perpendicular as it enters. It's down at, okay. um, across Let's from the UPS building. So, I don't know how well that shows up on the, oh, the computer is very <laughs> slow. <laughs> Respond. Sorry. <coughs> Bad technology. Um, so the green outline is um, uh, it goes down for about another block. Let me just read the street there. Um, 
so yes it is on the in terms of that end it's a, one of those you know legs that goes out the same way it sort of goes up King Street to um, the church uh, building on King Street um, about where um, Trumbull comes in on yeah, King I'm Street. I really wondering how, and, how, how close to the edge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was really what I was wondering. Right. Okay. So I'm interested in our discussion, but I think maybe it might be useful to clarify what's before us. Um, there's been an awful lot of talk tonight that's really been about the the building itself and not necessarily the um, what has placed this before us tonight. Mm -hmm. So I mean I, um, I understand that there's a concern of, for the mass of the building and, and a lot of issues that were brought up in public <coughs> hearings held before we went to Architecture Review Board. We went through two Architecture Review Boards and we went through Planning Board and we're here. So um, I feel like some in some ways we need to sort out the, the comments that have been said and get to the issues that are before us to actually vote on so that we're clear about what we're going to be voting on and why it is brought before us so um, I'll take a crack at that or you can okay um, <laughs> whatever works for you. well I think the the two points that we started the night with were that the guidelines uh, uh, were not applied to the full building. Um, I think the, um, and the second is about the historic building. So um, I'd be interested in sort of your thoughts about those two issues because I think that clarifies why it has been brought uh, before us tonight. And I'd look for your nod of agreement, too, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thoughts on that about, uh, we heard the hearings before, yeah, Bill? No, I, I agree, and I kind of understand what we're here for. And I'm looking through all these guidelines, and, and I think the one that troubles me <coughs> most is guideline number 10. That's the guideline for clean landmark building wall surfaces uh, which are visible from streets should be predominantly brick and or traditional <coughs> varieties of stone. Um, and there is significant portions of this building outside this facade kind of on the Pleasant Street and corner that are visible and um, we don't even know what the color of the building is going to be. Granted the architectural committee apparently doesn't have control over the color but brick is a color as well as, as well as a material. Um, and that concerns me um, and I'm and <coughs> to me the spirit of that regulation has not been followed um, and that's a concern. of that guideline yeah yes. Alan I I think that's an issue but Bill I, I it, the, the guideline does say um, stucco is an acceptable surface for walls not fronting on a street now this isn't stucco, but I suspect that from 50 feet away, it looks essentially indistinguishable from stucco, I, I would think. Um, hopefully the architect won't end, or the owner, if they build it, uh, won't end up with off-white or light gray or whatever it is. That looks terrible. Um, but color aside, it, from, from 50 or 100 feet away, it seems like it would look exactly like stucco, which is acceptable. Um, I, a second thing that strikes me is, um, well, two other things. One, as far as the overall, the size, which obviously is a major issue, and it, so it comes up in the guidelines. As Carolyn pointed out in her memo, the, the um, it gets compared not only to the adjacent buildings, it certainly dwarfs some adjacent buildings, but it's downtown of the, as a whole. It, um, it specifically says, and Carolyn, you underlined that in your staff comment, comparing the building to downtown as a whole, it's not particularly tall at all. Um, and the other thing in terms of the sides, and I'm not sure how relevant this is, but about a month before this application came up, 
the board approved, hardly with any discussion, the HAP building, which is only a block away from this one, and is five stories instead of four stories, and has brick facade on Pleasant Street, and when it wraps around, it's got the same sort of industrial composite look. Now that's not, as far as comparisons, that's not in existence, but it's been approved and presumably will get built. So I, I don't understand why there haven't been more um, comments made comparing it to that one that sailed through and never got appealed. Um, but compared to that, this is perfectly appropriate. Going back to the guidelines under 10, I think there's a certain confusion about what's visible and what's fronting. And, and it's hard to know when you look at those two things and you're talking about fronting and visible and it feels as if the second line is, is refers back to the top line and yet it says fronting. And so I, I can see some complexity in trying to understand how you split those terms, which I thought were a little difficult. Yeah. Well, I think certainly anything that's visible from the street is definitely within the purview and the jurisdiction of the Central Business Architecture Committee. Right. And that's clear, and they discussed right. that. There was no um, issue in terms of them worried that they were um, trying to um, make a determination that wasn't their jurisdiction. They talked about all the facades. And they knew that all these facades were, were visible. But then there is that distinction about fronting on the street. And, and there are examples of buildings that have, and they're re-entered into the conversation this evening about um, clabbered sidings going back along the sides of other buildings that are um, actually historic buildings themselves. Um, so I don't, I think the idea is they want to have review of anything that's visible, but there um, are different um, standards for those that are right up on the street where the pedestrian is, trying to encourage that, um, you know, that um, street um, fronting facade experience. Um, and then just going back, I want to, um, about the Guideline 10 that, um, uh, Bill, that you mentioned is that, um, the determination would be if the if the central business architecture considered the guideline, not whether you would agree with their consideration, the way they came down on the consideration, um, but sort of going into more detail about that, there are other materials that are allowed. I'm not hardy plank wasn't so prevalent, if at all, 16 years ago when these guidelines were written. But stucco is sort of a cement type of material that was written into because it was more of a common material that you would see as an alternative to brick at the time. Um, but this heart, this cement board is meant to um, look like clabbered, um, which is a kind of uh, material, obviously, that you see a lot in the buildings. But the, and in my staff memo, I pointed to other projects at the. Um, Central Business Architecture Committee has approved that incorporate other materials that are not brick or stone, and those um, facades do face, um, are visible from the street, but are not fronting the street, so. So are, are you saying that all we have to know is that they considered it, even if they disregarded it, I guess? I, I, I'm a little confused there. Well, I don't, uh, I mean, I, I suppose you can make the determination that they disregarded it. I think the question is, did they evaluate it and um, is it, was it within their purview to approve that? Um, and, um, or did they make an error and not, and just sort of gl gloss over that and they were, they were not allowed to approve a different material um, under that criteria? And so my, um, what I was attempting to show in my memo was that um, yeah, there is some latitude in sort of looking at different facades and, and considerations of particular buildings, not that they're throwing out the guidelines, but there are alternative materials that could be incorporated into a design, but still meet the, um, that guideline and the overall intent of the, of the downtown architecture guidelines as a whole. 
and they have done that on a number of occasions throughout the downtown, um, allowing materials that are not brick or stone um, visible from the street. Um, Carla? Yeah, so, um, and that um, number 10, um, it talk, guideline 10, it talks about uh, facsimile materials, and it, certainly the fiber cement board would definitely be a facsimile material to wood clabbered, and that's, <coughs> that's the design, it's, and it's not even stucco, it won't even be a stucco look, it's, go, it's going to, I mean it's put on, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's shipboard, it's clapboard siding, it just happens to be made out of cement board instead of wood. Um, I did struggle with that too, that wood, you know, wood siding isn't in guideline 10. Um, but could you help Carolyn uh, understand your, there's a, there's um, something's quoted further down under number four. In the second paragraph, it says other aspects of this section also read. And number three talks about wood frame construction, especially on Upper Pleasant Street. So kind of what, where is that, what was that pulled from? Um, so you're referencing guideline four, is that what you said, or 10, sorry? Uh, no, in your uh, memo, uh, okay. bullet point number four, error in interpreting the character defining features. Oh, okay. And then second paragraph, number three. I'm just not sure where that was pulled from. And I'll just finish by saying, you know, if we look at, I mean, there's there's many examples in in that neighborhood of, of buildings that aren't masonry that um, are wood siding. Um, so I don't think that that I don't see that as as being going against the guidelines. So that would have been, um, I'm just going to go to the guidelines here on page mm -hmm. 46, I think is where I was referencing that. Which part of her memo? Do you think it would be a question? Do you think without it being brick, it qualifies as a theme building? That I guess I'd struggle with that. Then it's just been kind of funny looking. Um, I think talks about outside. Yes, because we're talking about the, the the theme buildings. The characteristics are, you know, the primarily. Um, glazing on the first floor facades fronting the sidewalks and the street and the, the building, uh, I'm sorry, the windows, um, other detailing of those front facades are typical characteristics of theme commercial buildings. So, and there are other theme commercial buildings, you know, further north of here that have that same similar characteristic where the front has the brick facade with the um, glazing, first floor glazing, and then upper floor windows are, are, you know, a different character. But then the sides of the buildings go back and they're not that same brick facade. So I think that's consistent with um, theme commercial characteristics for some buildings. Can I just address an issue on that point, please? Sure. Thank you. Very quickly, talking about the wall surfaces. I'm only walking now, so I'm not dropping paper. Wall surfaces uh, under 10, wall surfaces which are visible from streets should be predominantly brick. Um, there's no addressing 
in the decision, which is what you're looking at, of anything about wall surfaces other than those ones that touch Pleasant and Holyoke. So they don't talk about it at all, about all of those walls that are visible uh, other than those two front parts. It talks about first floor facades as a theme building, as Ms. Mish just said, storefronts are primarily glass, recessed entry, facade buildings. It says facade materials. Brick facades were wrapped around the entire street facing facades. It, it's not in fact accurate because there's a lot that faces the street that doesn't have brick on it. Um, it's th those portions that are on. The only thing I would add to that is that of all these examples in the photographs that were um, presented to you by the architect, but um, also by your own knowledge of the area, when we're talking about a brick building in front and then clabbered going back, that's typically when the sides go straight back from the road. In this case, that um, fiberboard is going to be parallel to Pleasant Street for that incredibly long expanse, and this is where the mass comes in, and so large, you will see that side from everywhere. That's the standard that was not applied. It's, it's, there's no question that sometimes there can be um, clapboard on the sides of the building going back, but that's, th these examples are not um, the same as what you're seeing here. What you're seeing here is facing the Pleasant Street, that um, huge expanse. Um, so I think there's a distinction between what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Finn. What, of course, my learned opponent wants to overlook is the word should in the dictionary means ought to, but not necessarily will. It is not a standard. It is a guideline. If it was mandatory <coughs> and it was somehow unlawful or grounds for appeal not to follow it, it would have been written with the shirt word shall which is the general term used for mandatory direction. Should is precisely what a guideline is all about. It makes it as it should be a matter of professional design judgment. I believe there's two architects on the CBAC. That's the reason why we had our architect speak, and I've only tried to address here very specific narrow issues. Should is not a mandatory or required term. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to get back to the board discussion. Did you get your question framed to Carolyn? Okay. John, anything to say? Any um, opinions? Well, I think, um, you know, having uh, sat through um, both the previous hearings, uh, I guess, you know, and from a practical sense, it would be hard to say um, that um, the CBAC did not consider, you know, what the decision they were making. I mean, we, you know, we were both, we were all here for too very long and, and I know that there were changes and so it would be hard to say that they didn't consider what was before them, I mean, from that standpoint. Um, from the other, uh, you know, from the uh, historic building point, um, um, it's in my mind, two things make a building historic. Um, one is the age of the building, the other is the integrity of the building that still remains. Um, you know, there's a lot of historic buildings by age, but they're not necessarily still historic because they have been re renovated, re you know, connected, de you know, they've been made lots of different changes, which would, in my mind, would no longer make them historic because they're not in their original form uh, or, or content. So, um, you know, that, I guess that's kind of, I mean, I, I guess I'm kind of with, with Alan that, um, you know, it, it certainly seems like it was well considered and you know, I think the example of the building uh, that we consider just down the street, which will be actually larger, um, you know, sets a context to the to the conversation. Anything more from mm -hmm. Anne? Yeah. I, I would agree with that one. I mean, I think I think Davis Square clearly demonstrated that they use the design guidelines as sort of their basis for design. Um, the Central Business uh, Architectural Commission uh, even kind of had issue with, with some of that, and so they came back with a redesign. Um, I, I don't see in any of the process, uh, everything I saw in the process demonstrated that, that the guidelines were considered and looked at and adhered to. 
And uh, I think this, the, the document we got tonight clearly shows that uh, they researched the historic significance of that mill building and it came up that it wasn't historically significant. Yeah. I think they did submit, they, there was also a conversation during the hearing, so it's not just that it was submitted mm -hmm. now, that okay. the building was not usable um, and that the front part, the, the reason why my staff memo I showed the Pleasant Street facade was to show that there had been another building inserted into the front of that building that essentially cut a hole into that historic mill building. And so that changes mm -hmm. what you would need to do. You can't just look at the back of the building and say the back looks great, it should be restored. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole other factor to it. Um, and that was presented during the discussions. Um, and there was discussion about the fact that that building was going to come down. But the replacement building will provide vibrancy, which is one of the, the key standards for the Central Business Architecture Committee to approve a building. And there were lots of statements about this building was going to improve the vibrancy in uh, of the pedestrian character for downtown, as well as this Pleasant Street. They The last building that they um, reviewed for demolition was the church site on King Street on the other side of Main Street. And that was truly a historic standalone, I think, 1700s building. We don't even see a building yet there because of the church's time frame. Mm -hmm. um, but the, and, and so that certainly was another, um, you know, wrangling the committee had to do on that. And so they've done this before. Um, but, uh, you know, I think. Well, and I think there is a different um, a approach to working on an existing historic building. If you want to work on that building, you have to put it back to its own standards. And I think that's what happened to Mr. Royal when he's being forced to do things to that building to put it back as it was, because <coughs> of the it was, which puts you in a very different situation when you're working on a new building. Um, I remember during the previous hearings that there was no Form 40B on this build, the building that would have been my assurance that someone is telling me, someone who knows historic buildings, not me, would determine whether that building was historic or not, and that documentation was not there. So I'm um, relieved to see that there is some documentation now that I can um, consider from Mass Historic that tells me uh, what they know, what they think about that building. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. So just to follow up on the memo and your questions mm -hmm. about the, the last, um, the, there is a section of the guidelines that talks about sort of overarching characteristics for downtown that should be incorporated, you know, to the extent possible in new construction. And so those are the points that um, are also important um, and were reviewed by the Central Business Architecture mm -hmm. Committee. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if that yeah, that's clears up here. Thank you. Um, just back to that point number 10, and um, you know, it does say they should be, but they don't have to be. I guess in reading that, they should be unless there's reasons why they shouldn't be. And I'm wondering if there's any record or recollection of why those portions shouldn't be brick or similar surfaces. That Was it, that not cost or more other things I would expect? Well, you might expect, but I don't know if that I was thought discussed. There, I thought I there guess. was. I'm not sure, but I thought there, there was. was discussed. It was also mm -hmm. uh, logically behind another building, even though you could see the top portion of it. It was not, it was not street front. And but I mean, it was visible from the street, right? Yeah. Which is the kind of. The, the other piece of it, there was a conversation about cost, and I think that was um, stated again um, tonight. Somebody mentioned that that was raised during the public hearing process. Um, and the other piece of it is there's always got to be an acknowledgement of the fact that buildings can, uh, you know, there's an evolution of building construction, and certainly um, there is the opportunity in the coming decades for buildings to change and expand and so to a certain extent anyone who's investing in property in downtown knowing that there's a zero setback um, has to understand and sort of plan for the fact that new buildings could be built in front of and so 
there is that acknowledgement since this, this is an odd shaped lot, it's L shaped and not the, the entire building doesn't um, front on a street that there is the opportunity for buildings to be built even taller in front of it. Um, so it's not to say that they're ignoring any guidelines but there's also that opportunity as the decades go on that buildings could change that are in front of it and may not always be visible from the street. Okay, I suggest we close public hearing now. So moved. John, second. Carla, second. All in favor? Uh, okay. We have some. Can I just ask a question? Just a quick, real quick. Yes, sir. Um, uh, wait, I'm going against our vote. Is everybody in agreement? Quick question. Yes. Um, I just want to make a little tiny statement. I believe there was an actual Form B on this property that was submitted before. And what it shows is my building, S256 Pleasant Street, and when it was actually divided, that became um, a historic building that's actually connected to it, became 256, and we became 270, I believe. But I believe that was submitted. But in terms of a historic building, wouldn't it, like I understand like buildings get changed and stuff like that. I live in a historic town, Deerfield, much like Northampton. Things get changed all the time. Most of the houses and stuff like that in Deerfield are not registered, but they're historic buildings. And also, they're changed, but they're still historic buildings. And I think it's just. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so we've closed public here uh, public comment period. Um, I think it's time to sort of clarify what's before us, and I'd welcome any more comments anyone has on it. Um, I'm ready. Um, that's where I'm headed. Um, yeah, the other thing to add, I don't know if you want to take a separate vote on the issue of, you know, the aggrieved party status or standing, um, or if you want to just have one vote on the merits <coughs> of the appeal. Are these things not separable? I mean, just the the elements of it that have come under question, are they voted on separately? No, or no, no it's one appeal. No, we, we would then be piecemealing the well, decision. I was wondering what the... Um, and so I think the, the, the overall question is, is there an... It, it has the... Not the applicant, the... Um, appellant. The appellant been aggrieved by either the... Uh, guidelines not applying correctly or by the process of following the consideration of the historic building. So I think those two points are, are what they are characterizing as they were aggrieved by and that's the vote we're going to take. So a yes would be, I'm just working my way through this, a vote to yes would be that the um, appeal would be granted and it would go back to the central architecture um or have i got it backwards well then if you were to uphold or if you were to um you either vote to uphold the decision by the central business architecture committee um or grant the appeal okay um so yes then if then if you if no further action were taken after you, let's say, overturn the decision, then it would have okay, to Okay, so that's, I'm, I'm stating uh, the reverse yes of what, I, what yeah, I'm getting at. I don't think that, if the, if the planning board votes to uphold the, the, the grant or the permit, in other words, deny the appellant's appeal, then whether or not they're an aggrieved party is irrelevant. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I, I was. If I mean, if the committee voted to uphold their appeal, then they would have to have been an aggrieved party, right? But only in that case. So it would be appropriate for the motion to say that we vote on uh, upholding the Central Architecture Review Board's decision. Yeah, I'll so move. I'm sorry. We are voting to 
uphold the central architecture business review decision. Right. Or someone can make a motion either way to make a motion, move to uphold or yeah. move to over. Yeah, I started out going the other way, yeah. but Carolyn's, it's cleaner this way. Yeah. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we uh, deny the appeal, thereby upholding the decision. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to just, yeah. Go for one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uphold, uphold the decision. Uphold yes. We deny the appeal. It's either deny or approve, right? Right. So I want to be clear that you all understand what your what your vote will mean when you vote. Mm -hmm. So if you vote a yes, you are upholding the decision and denying the appeal. If you vote no, you are not upholding the decision. Do I hear a second? I second. And seconded it. All in favor of upholding the Central Architecture Committee's decision. Post. Appeal did not. Uh, we supported the decision. Um, we have minutes, and I think that'll be the end of the agenda. Okay, so I sent two sets of minutes, but only look at the second one. <laughs> Is there a second to that? Oh, I second the minutes, having read well. them well. All in favor of uh, approving the minutes of um, uh, March 26th? Second and two. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, entertain a motion to. So, so I just want to note note that the other items that were on the agenda right. will move to May twenty seventh, uh, May fourteenth. That's your next. Meeting. <laughs> That's your next meeting is May fourteenth. Oh, we don't have another one. No, no. school vacation. Week. Oh, right. thank you. Um, and um, and we are sort of lacking coverage in the office. <laughs> um, and we're not ready yet to go into the street acceptance. Um, so I guess those are the other, yeah, the other two items. So we'll just push those off to the 14th. Sunset. Oh, sunset. Good. <laughs> this helps. <laughs> this is there. Yeah. Are we adjourned? Then, I don't know. I don't think we're ready. No, we need well, to well, adjourn. Well, this is not, no. And yeah. John, all in favor? Of adjourning. Adjourning, adjourning people. We're adjourning. Thank you.